Thanks for listening to the AZ Wildcats podcast, a special Sunday-only edition. All right, joined by Anthony Gimino and William Brad Alice. I am merely Mike Luke. Arizona advances to the Sweet 16, fellas. Um, guys, this was a this was a this was just a very nice performance. Um, Arizona gets out early. It looks like they're going to give the lead back, and they don't give the lead back. And Jaden Bradley to the rescue. There, AG you wrote an article about this. I did. Uh, that's a heck of a plan B for uh, Tommy Lloyd to have Jaden Bradley on those days when whatever reason, maybe Boswell hurt his hand early. Maybe that was a factor, but he didn't have it. He wasn't scoring. He wasn't shooting. He w- wasn't really assisting. So now it's different. Now it's one and done. And I mentioned this in the story that coaching in the regular season is way different than coaching in the postseason. Right. Regular season, you're managing egos. You're trying to keep everybody's confidence up. You're trying to every define roles. Postseason is you got to be a killer. Right. And if it comes down to, you know, I, I am 100 percent not advocating for a change in starting lineup. I think that's stupid. But this was, you know, I looked up the stats. This is the first there were two games this year where Bradley played more minutes than Boswell. In each of those two cases, he played just two more minutes. Against Dayton, he played nine more minutes. To me, that's postseason Tommy. That's Lloyd making adjustments at the right time for the right reasons. And, you know, first game was Boswell, right? We loved his shooting. He's, he's you know, scores 20 points. Everybody, he's everybody's favorite again. Now it's Bradley. That's good. Right. They're, different, they're different players, and whoever's got the hot hand, maybe they'll both have the hot hand. Ride that player. That's what he did. Right. And well, only thing I will say, and Brad William Brad Alice has said from the beginning of the season that he thought Bradley was better and he should start Bradley. So I will give William this. But again, I'm not making a change at this point. My yeah. only thing was I thought that again, my only con- my only concern was that I thought that, and again, I'm nitpicking here. I thought that Lloyd should have gone to Bradley earlier in the second half when that lead was cut down to three. I mean, uh, Boswell was in there for the first six minutes. And I guess my concern was, is that, listen, if, if you're not going to shoot, if you're not going to look at the rim, it's, it's difficult for me to have you out there. It's, you know, and again, I give Tommy credit, but we're also not just giving out courtesy minutes at this point. I mean, Boswell was bad and Bradley saved the day. I actually wish they had gone to him a little bit earlier there, William. Yeah, and you guys all know I'm an unabashed uh, Bradley fanboy, have been for, for quite a while. Um, I will say this. I thought last uh, yes, last last night, yesterday morning's game uh, was an evolution in Tommy Lloyd as a coach because last year against Princeton, ironically enough, he didn't go to Boswell enough. Uh, he rode Kirk Creesa, who was bad. Um, right. this, this year, again, I would I have liked it two minutes earlier? Absolutely. But I was fine with it. He rode the hot hand. And really, I think only kind of brought Boswell back in when I think Bradley was just uh, kind of wearing down a little bit. I mean, Bradley played a long stretch there. Um, I will say this. I think it was an interesting chess match coaching-wise. And I think if there was, you know, one criticism of Tommy Lloyd, it's that, you know, he's still evolving as an in-game uh, coach. Uh, because, you know, you don't have to make those decisions on the bench. I think as Italian evaluator, we've seen he has it. As a developer of talent, he has it. As a managing your roster through the season, for the most part, he has it. Um, I thought yesterday they made Dayton blink first. Because um, I thought so for the first four minutes, that pace with moving Duran Holmes all over the court, I was like, there's no way Balo is going to survive. There's no way Crease is going to survive. Um and Dayton got away from it because Love made some big shots. Right. And then they went to the pick and roll, and then Tommy countered with going small. And I thought Tommy made them blink first and did had an answer for every counter. Um, and really, in the second half, I know we all wanted them to win by 17. Uh, they kept him at arm's length. They really, in the second half, never got it down to more than four. And every time they got down to four, it was quickly back to six or seven. Right. Um, so I really thought that was uh, Tommy Lloyd really taking a step. And maybe it's just something we haven't noticed much because every possession is more important in, in the postseason. But I thought Tommy Lloyd had a, a had a, a, a counter move for everything they tried to do with Dayton. Yeah, I thought they did as well. And, um, you know, Umar Ballo was taken out, obviously, because, listen, Umar's awesome. Um, I would love Umar Ballo to come back next year. But Umar Ballo, when teams can get him isolated in the pick and roll, 
he generally has some issues there because he's kind of flat footed. And if he can't just drop to the basket, he gets kind of caught in no man's land. Arizona wins small then with Keyshawn Johnson. And again, Deron Holmes is a monster, but Anthony, one of the things that this team really has going for it is that they can go big against big teams. They can go small against small teams. They, the, the roster construction is very, very good. And you saw that against Dayton. Yeah. There's eight guys that can, that gives Tommy multiple teams, right? And some some of Arizona teams haven't had that, so yeah, you can go you can go small with Kishad, um, and it, and it won't hurt you necessarily. But they can play; they prefer to play fast, and they prefer to play with Bala. Right. They can play small. They can also grind you a little bit, and they're not bad in the half court. Some Arizona teams have been really bad in the half court. Right. Uh, we know we know zone defenses have been a problem, but zone defenses have been a problem for Arizona for 35 years. So that's not necessarily new. Um, it's certainly part of Arizona's kryptonite. That's a way you. That's one way you can beat them, um, but it's not necessarily a killer because this Arizona team has does have those multiple weapons as you talked about, and it can play different styles. And you're going to see a lot of different styles if you want to go six games in the NCAA tournament. Right. And Brad, I mean, that's uh, that's something that you have. And again, Arizona's bench, we got to, we'll talk, let's talk Crevis. People are mentioning Crevis. Yeah. Crevis, I've been saying this all year. I don't know when the game is, and maybe it was this past game, or maybe it's going to be a game in the future, but Crevis is going, there's going to be a time when they're going to have to count on him in kind of a Donnell Harris type way. Where again, I'm not saying that he's going to be getting you offensive rebound putbacks in the national championship game in overtime, but there's going to be a time when when uh, Crevis is going to be called upon. He played very well yesterday. He got some good minutes against Long Beach State. When he has when when Crevis is a, you're able to count on Crevis off the bench, that just gives their margin for error even more there, William. Yeah, and I was a little surprised they didn't go to Crevis a little bit more in the second half when they did want to go big because I thought he did a very good job on Holmes. In fact, really, I think one of the only times Holmes scored on him was, uh, was that clear push off. Um, but yeah, he gave him some quality minutes on defense. He actually made a couple plays on offense. We saw him finally dunk the ball. I thought that was very nice. Um, he's still putting the ball on the floor too much. Yeah. The, the other thing I thought was interesting. We talked, you know, to go back to Balo is while I think going small helped Arizona defensively, I think it actually hurt him offensively without Balo. Um, right. I think it Balo frees up, so much space. He does. Um, I think that is one reason, and not the only. I think he just went cold too. Love struggled a little bit in the second half. Um, you know, Balo for his issues on defense against the pick and roll, they couldn't defend him either. Um, had they been able to defend the pick and roll, Balo Balo's probably going for 27 in that game. I mean, he was they tried to front him, it didn't work. Um, so yeah, really shout out to Balo too. And then credit Tommy, who just decided we're gonna win this game with defense. Um, we're going to lose a little bit of our offensive flexibility and, and go small and uh, obviously at work. But, yeah, that's what you're going to need. when you. If we go back to all the great Arizona runs, there is always someone off the bench, someone unexpected doing something. Again, the Donnell Harris, it's the Donnell Harris Award. Um, but, again, I always bring up the Kirk Walters against UAB. Um, you know, the, there was that, that game against Texas with the point guard off the bench, whose name always escapes me, and it drives me crazy. Oh, Jordan oh. Mays, come on, Jordan Mays. It's, <laughs> my, it's my Uber Eats moment. You know that thing you can't remember that right. awful commercial that's running right now. Um, you know whether you know it's, you know, a big rebound here or there. Um, you know, Rayo's corner three in '94. There's always someone making a play, and that's what the great teams do. They have to be able to rely on their bench, and whether that bench goes too deep, five deep, or as Arizona's case, three deep, you're going to need it. And today it was Bradley with a little bit of Crevis sprinkled in. And <clears throat> let's give you know KJ played pretty well too. Mm -hmm. um, you know he 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 had some foul issues, but other than that, I thought he played a good basketball game as well. Yeah, KJ's a monster. KJ, is, uh, Charles Barkley likes talking about teams that have nuclear weapons that come off the bench. Arizona's got two of them. KJ Lewis is a difference maker. I always, I love to give sheer crap about this because I was one of the few things I was right on. This is this kid should have been a five star player. This is not what a top one hundred fringe one hundred player looks like. This is a dude that's just different than uh, he just looks different. And the fact that they put him on Deron Holmes in the second half, and granted he was fouling him each time, I get it, but that just goes to show you too the confidence they have in the young man, and that he's a six four wing, and you're putting him on a six eight All American. 
Yeah, Look I mean, he can go is, yeah. Go ahead, Brad. Oh, you know, we, we've made that comparison to uh, Hassan Adams, um, you know, a little bit to, to Juwan McClellan. But, you know, Adams was a 6'5 power forward for his first two years at Arizona and actually, you know, was, was a monster of a score out of position. And Lewis, because he is advanced physically, I mean, he's a big, strong kid for an 18-year-old, is able to do that. You combine that with his athleticism and his tenacity. Yes, you know, Holmes got his. I forget what he finished in the 20s, but they, there weren't many easy buckets for him. Um, in fact, when, when Dayton looked their best, it was because Holmes was taking defenders away from the basket and they were getting those kind of easy layups. Uh, they had that little stretch where I think they had four un, five uncontested layups and, you know, but yeah, credit Lewis because he's a grinder. Um, you know, a lot of freshmen can come in, even though he wasn't that heralded and said, well, I'm only a two guard. I'm only a wing. I no, you tell KJ Lewis to go guard a seven footer. He'll, he'll do it. He might get manhandled, but he'll do it. And that's the kind of attitude you need to be championship basketball team. Yeah. Anthony. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's kind of what Tommy mentioned in the, in the post game pressure too. The reason you can have a game like this is that for 30 some games, Jaden Bradley accepted his role. You know, who knows what's going on behind the scenes? What kind of egos are there? Who's complaining about what? But some guys can accept being that six man like Pella Larson did before Jaden. And some guys can't. Right. You know, some guys need that boost of being in the starting lineup. Miles and Simon probably was not going to be cool coming off the bench. Exactly. JT, yeah, he's the one who went to loot and said, I'll come off the bench. Not, right. ev not everybody can do that or can excel in that role. Not saying that's the case with Boswell, but you need those, you know, as Tommy, but the sacrifices when you're playing on a, a great team like 2024 Arizona, you're going to have guys. I mean, I'm sure Jaden Bradley thinks, and he's probably right. Yeah. He could be playing 30 minutes a game. Well, okay. He's playing 20, but make those real super high quality 20. And when called upon, you can, you can like against Dayton, you can play nearly 30 minutes. Yeah. And I'm kind of at the point too, with Jane Bradley, where I think you just got to give him a salute emoji because listen, I mean, he's, you know, I think it's fair to say that better than Kylan Boswell. I'm not saying that Boswell won't be better in the future. Who knows? But right now, he is a much better basketball player than Kylan Boswell. He brings more on a consistent basis. And he's clearly okay with coming off the bench. I got to give him a lot of credit for that because most kids wouldn't be okay with that, William. No. And, you know, the one thing, Luke was able to get guys to accept roles like this, and to a lesser extent, Miller, is because you're, in addition to selling winning, you are selling the NBA. And quite frankly... The NBA doesn't care what your college stats were. Right. They don't care how – I mean, obviously, you have to play some. You have to put some some image on tape. Uh, but they're looking at how are you going to translate to the next level. And this is why, you know, when all these people – you know, there was that – remember that whole, you know, Raleigh Elkins fan club and the – like, oh, he's going to be – Raleigh Elkins didn't have a pro game. But a guy, you know, what was it? Marvin Williams was the number two pick in the draft coming off the bench for North Carolina. Right. Why? Because he had a pro game. Now, he didn't end up having a good career. But that's what the NBA does. They don't care. They don't care if you're a 35, you know, the kid for Oakland, right? Set an NCAA record for numbers of threes. That kid's not even going to training <laughs> camp. Uh, the, the, the joke about him selling insurance is accurate because, again, the NBA is looking for a style. And Jaden Bradley, frankly, has shown enough that if the NBA deems him worthy, they'll draft him or bring him to camp as a guy off the bench right? because he has a pro game. And, and once guys accept that and understand that, and there was a great comment, sat next to Hassan Adams to bring it all, all back around. Um at the old Nike camp in Indianapolis. He was one of the counselors. And it was during the Indy EB saga. Right. And he mentioned something like, and he was only a sophomore at the time, going into a sophomore season. You know, EB was talking about scoring 24 points a game, 27 points a game, taking 20 shots a game. And Hassan said, and he was talking to someone else, but I was eavesdropping. Apologies mm -hmm. to Hassan Adams. You don't come to Arizona to score 27 a game. You come to Arizona to win 27 and hopefully make 27 million. Um, and I think that kind of sums up the, the, the guys who understand the process can accept their roles. Cause again, look at JT three years off the bench, one year national player of the year, 
longest NBA career of any Arizona player, I believe. Right. Um, maybe Andre passed him finally, but and that guy made what I don't know, hundred million dollars at least. He made a lot of money, um, and he was a role player for three years. Right. All right. Now moving forward, then obviously you, know, you got Nor- We don't know who Arizona is going to play yet, but obviously we've seen North Carolina. North Carolina to me reminds me a lot of Arizona. To be honest mm-hmm. with you, that's the comparison that I keep going back. You got kind of the big plotter, big man in the middle, and uh, Armando Baycott and the new Umar Ballo, and then you've got Harrison Ingram, who is now good now that he got out of Stanford and Jared Hass and Keisha Johnson, kind of in similar. Cormac Ryan, Pella Larson, uh, R.J. Davis, Caleb Love, uh, Godot. Jaden Bradley slash uh, um, uh, Kylan Boswell. It's kind of an even matchup, to be honest with you. It's a, it's intriguing for me because stylistically, it's pretty even as well. But yeah. haven't they always been? I mean, let's go all the way back. Arizona and North Carolina have always, especially when they were under Roy Williams, but they're always they're more up tempo than a lot of their comp- uh, uh, comp- you know parents. Since they uh always have NBA players. They always have versatile athletic players. Um, that's why a lot of, you know, and they really haven't matched up as much as you would think they have over the years, but some of their games have been classics. Right. Um, you know, again, I think the, the similarities to Arizona, and those Roy William Kansas teams too, they always look kind of like each other. And that is, that ends up being the collision course in the elite eight. When you add the subplot of the Caleb love game, uh, it, it should make for a fantastic basketball game. Now each team has to get that through the week 16, um, but it does look like in a, it, it, they're on a collision course. Yeah, so Mike, you just skip right over this week 16 game, right? Well, I don't know who they're playing. <laughs> That's true. I Either mean, way, I, I would love to sit here and tell you that. Uh, yeah. So, yes, I did speak. I, we don't know they're going to be playing North Carolina either. That. You know what? That is a fair point, Anthony Jamino. I cannot sit here and uh, dispute nope. anything you just said. By the way, Bridge Tech Communications are uh, are contrarian. The problem with Arizona is a rhythm team. Keep in mind, Bridge Tech picks against Arizona every single time. While it's nice to be able to insert different lineups and different styles, it's hard to go to rhythm if it doesn't get enough minutes. I disagree with that. I think everybody got. I think everybody gets enough minutes. I don't know anybody that's been getting, getting enough minutes. minutes all year. Right. I mean, look at look at like he's playing. F- 13 guys and one game, a guy's getting five and one game, the guy's getting 25. They're all getting consistent minutes. Right. By the way. All right. Now this Joseph with a question that Anthony, I think was asking that I didn't even think what if GCU Ooh. beats UNC? That's uh yeah. that's a, uh, you know, okay. here, I will say this. Can, can we see if they can beat Alabama first? That's, that's very true. That's GCU. True. But you, I like them a lot. Did you ever think that we would be at a point where GCU would be have clearly a better basketball roster than ASU. And not only that, going <laughs> forward, it's probably a better it's probably better position. Do you guys did you guys ever see that? Adley? Well, yes. yes. Yeah. Right. right <laughs> Jerry Colangelo. Everybody well, thought I think that. messed some things up too. I mean, along the way. I mean, um when they you know he blew Russ Pennell out of there after like winning like 27 games. But they Price obviously- is the right guy. It's all they, about the coach. To no, no, in. no. It is obviously, yeah. Marley wasn't the right guy, or he was the right, or you know, he was good. He was fine. Mm-hmm. But you knew with the, that money, with Colangelo and his little consortium or whatever, that they made an effort. They decided they wanted to be a basketball school. ASU has no such desire. Um, True. ASU in, in any sport right now. So if you say, "Look, we've got the guy who built the Phoenix Suns," and in many ways kind of help create the 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 modern nba and the modern olympic program and he wants to focus his time and energy and his retirement towards our basketball program i'm not shocked um you know i part of me almost wonders why it took so long right um because you know and then when you got those students to buy in and it looks like they traveled to spokane i mean that's not salt lake city which is nine hours away that's that's a, that's a, it's a hike um but they went up there they're supporting the team um you know and at some point they're going to figure some nil stuff out and they're going to get one of the remember when howard got all the five stars that one year or they got the two five gcu is going to end up doing that with some nil money they're going to get some you know whether it's a phoenix kid or something or a kid who's you know very strong in his faith who wants to go to that religious you know kind of school and they might blow it up i could see i could yeah so no i'm not shocked um, it's kind of an indictment on ASU, but no, I'm not shocked. 
Yeah. yeah it, it, while it may be all about the coach, it's also all about the commitment. And that's what, that's what GCU has done. You know, if, if ASU had put some money into their arena or even take that in, you know, a lot of people are downsizing, like Baylor downsized their arena this year. That's going to be an unbelievable atmosphere with like eight to 9,000 people when Arizona goes there in the big 12, it's going to be insane. What if Arizona state had done something like that? And then you hire the coach and you make, you make that the destination school for a really big talent pool in Phoenix. And they can't, they're not not drawing any of that. They're not drawing any of that because it's a dreary, dark, yeah, yeah, there's, just, there's never been a time. There's never been a time when they've been in a lower moment, I, I believe. And I don't think that you're getting really out of it. And honestly, believe it or not, I think Bobby Hurley's the best you can do. Um, you because who is really going to want to take that job? They have absolutely no NIL. They don't, they have an administration that let's be honest here, quite frankly, does not really care about sports. You've got that dreary arena. You've got, why would any up and coming coach want, and you're going into the best basketball conference in the country. Why would any up and coming coach want to step into that? Well, I think the problem, I think there would be some young guys who would be hungry and think I, I can make it work. I can court the NIL, mm-hmm. but their problem was, and it was kind of like what Oregon did with Ernie Kent before they finally, turned. they kept saying, well, he's good enough. He's done enough not to be warranted to be fired. But at some point you have to decide, is this the guy who can take you to the next level? Is this the guy who can and, – and it was clear, you know, when Ernie Kent had a great point guard, Oregon was really good. But then they'd be a, a 500 team the next year. Um, you know, it's the kind of same thing with those Henry Bibby teams. And, and maybe now it's the Andy Enfield teams. Hurley is, keeps doing enough to save his job. But it's obvious that Bobby Hurley will never make ASU a, 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 a top 25 program. Three years ago, they should have probably said – Screw it. We're going to get in bed with Rick Pitino or, you know, two years ago, Chris Beard. Um, you know, it oh, might why would be those guys to even take that job. St. John's and Ole Miss. I'll take those jobs every day of the week over ASU. Because there's That's still, a- I think there's still this belief that you're in Phoenix. Um, maybe I have you no can- money. I'm broke and I have no support. Yeah, but there's there's corporate people there who may be again. You're taking a risk, but I think you've also may have missed that window um, with, with ASU. But ASU just settles. It's you know, it's. It's kind of, again, we don't want to fire Bobby Hurley because he's done a good enough job. Well, now he's done a good enough job so long that maybe you missed your you, you missed your window. Um, in many ways, and I know there are other things at play with the NCAA, I think that's kind of what Arizona decided on on Sean Miller. Right. Post, post allegations, you were never getting Arizona to – that was their decision, probably to the Final Four. Um, so we're going to roll the dice on Tommy Lloyd and, and so far it's been a good decision. All right. Now let's get back to it. We're going to preview a little bit here of uh, Anthony before the, uh, before the year, or actually when you and I were getting some drinks, I asked you and I said, you know, what's the, uh, what's, uh, no, this is, this, this happened just like Steve Rivera supposedly said back the a in the uh, media press room. Uh, multiple people have confirmed this with me that this did occur yesterday. So yeah, we still need some context. Still need some not context. all. I don't care. There's no context. It happened. It was ripping know. with sarcasm. I suspect he was being strongly sarcastic, but Steve doesn't like anything. But it did. You happen, do without what you will. Either way, either way, it happened. Okay. That what what you know the the background story matters not. But anyways, let's talk about uh, uh, Arizona, Anthony. I think you said that this team. There, this team should reach the elite eight. If I'm not going yep. to, if I, yes. And uh, I'm looking at the matchups now, whether that's Clemson or whether that's Baylor, I stand by your assertion. Do you stand by your own assertion as well? I am a hundred percent confirmed in that assertion. Right. That, you know, getting to the second week weekend was great. It's not going to take the heat off of Tommy. If he now loses to, to Baylor or Clemson. Mm-hmm. Getting to the regional final, you were playing North Carolina, for example. To me, that's a coin flip. That's a 50-50 game. If you if you win, great. You go in the final four. Let's uh, let's start figuring out what the statue is going to look like. Right. If you lose, like I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that because again, you just lost to a 50-50 game. You probably play that multiple times. You're going to win half, and you're not. Right. Um, so I think I think that's the bar. Anything beyond 
the lead eight to me is kind of gravy and more kudos for this team and Tommy. But that, that's the that's the that's the bar of expectations. Yeah, where are you at? Where are you at uh, with this, William? I think as long as they go in and play well again, I, I would say against Baylor. I think if you lose to Clemson, maybe I think it's a success because this team, to me, unless you are one of those classically great teams, Arizona teams, 88, 89, uh, 98, 01, 98, 01, 03, 05. Um, you should go, and even uh, maybe 05 is not fair because that was a, a two seed who was up and down. But then Elite Eight's the barometer. Shakur anything, was the point guard. Anything mm-hmm. beyond the Elite Eight, it's such a crapshoot. It's such a, uh, you know, the refs eating their whistles because they got caught up in the crowd in the Rosemont uh, Horizon Pavilion or whatever it is. Um, this team's not one of those classically great Arizona teams. So if you make it to the second weekend and play well, and Baylor, you know, just – beat you by four i don't consider it a disappointing season yeah um, at some point yes tommy has to get beyond that hump um but to me anything beyond this is, is again if they get blown out by Baylor, no it's a disappointment but to me the elite eight unless you you are literally undefeated unlv or undefeated kentucky expecting a final four is just too much because again it's such a weird tournament um you know all it takes is Derek Williams getting into foul trouble against UConn, and suddenly, uh, you, you know, your, your season comes down to a Jamel Horn three pointer. Um, you know, loot not loot not going back to Andre and Hassan against Kansas, um, and going to the ice cold Celine Stoudemire, and your season comes down to Jason Gardner off the back iron. Um, so to me, yeah, if you get to Baylor and play well, successful season. If you get to the Elite Eight, no matter the outcome, because Anthony's right, it's it's a coin flip successful season um you get blown out by clemson or baylor you lose by eight to clemson who's not great yeah. then it's a little bit of a disappointment but at least you know again tommy proved he can get out of that first weekend which after last year was a little bit of a and again they got a little lucky against tcu too yesterday they were just clearly the better more prepared team all right anthony wrap this one up what do you got what do i got you know i just so i'm on record which i haven't been on record yet I've got Carolina beating Arizona in the regional final. Yeah, but again, not not with any, uh, not with any. You're not uh, back in the A against North Carolina. I'm not, and, and part of that is in the brackets I'm in. I'm in with a lot of Arizona fans, so I'm trying to go strategically to play the opposite. You know, um, but yeah, that's it'll be fascinating. It'll be a great matchup. Um, takes me back to 1988 memories. Tom Tolbert over the right. Show. I was going to say Tom Tolbert killing it in, in LA. Game. That yep. was fantastic. Yep. I think if we get there, I might be writing about that, Mike. All right. Well, I'd like to hear about that. All right. Now, like, so anyway, it's weird. A little bit of a shorter show. I, uh, that's how I bribed Anthony to come on. But we'll be back with you tomorrow at 1030 for Anthony Jamino, William Brad Owlis. I'm merely Mike Luke. Appreciate you all for tuning in here. You guys are fantastic. And hold on. Let me find the end here. You've been listening to the AZ Wildcats podcast. <laughs> We all silly like the mayor.